Um, so first of all, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the annual, annual Ostrom Environmental Policy Lecture, the Ostrom Workshop. I think most of you probably know me, but for those of you that don't, uh, I'm Jess Steinberg. I am an Associate Professor in International Studies and the Director of the Environment and Natural Resource um, Governance Program here at the Ostrom Workshop. Um, and I am delighted to have the honor to introduce today's speaker, um, Professor Asim Prakash. Um, Dr. Prakash is the Walker Family Professor of the Arts and Sciences in Political Science um, at the University of Washington. Um, he is, this is gonna, this might take a few minutes. So just... <laughs> he is the founding director of the University of Washington Center for Environmental Politics, as well as the founding editor of the Cambridge University Press series in business and public policy and the Cambridge Elements series in organizational responses to climate change. He is also the recipient of the American Political Science Association's Eleanor Ostrom Career Achievement Award in 2020 and the International Studies Association Distinguished International Political Economy Scholar Award 2019. And these are just the recent awards. Um, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go further back than <laughs> a couple of years. Um, uh, to my mind, his work is remarkable for its intellectual contribution, its policy relevance, and the sheer breadth of inquiry. He explores public support for climate-related um, policies, the drivers and effectiveness of private and voluntary regulation related to environmental externalities, global climate governance, and um, as well as donor and NGO politics, public support for climate migrants. You can see it really, really um, casts a broad, broad net. He's the author of it, and I apologize if I get this wrong, at least five books. Plus or minus. <laughs> and hundreds of peer-reviewed articles which have been published in American Political Science Review, um, American Journal of Political Science, World Development, uh, Ecological Economics, to name only a few. And I have to say, I have relied heavily on Asim's work um, in my own scholarship and have really been strongly influenced by his approach, um, both when I was back, back as a grad student, but also uh, in my early years um, and since here at IU. Um, what is also amazing is that Professor Prakash finds time to, to be a, a public intellectual, uh, regularly contributing op-eds to a wide range of outlets, including the Washington, Washington Post, Forbes, um, Fox, Seattle Times. Um, he is a longtime friend of the workshop. He, along with his partner, uh, Nivas Dolsak, who's also here, um, is a graduate of IU's joint PhD program in political science and uh, what is now the O'Neill School, um, a, a few years ago now. Um, and, and also a student of Lynn Vincent Ostrom. Uh, and in fact, I think most of you probably know this, but for those of you that don't, um, Asim and Nivas were actually married here at the workshop, uh, which is uh, especially uh, wonderful, makes it especially wonderful to have them back. So we are really delighted to have you here. That's the evidence, dude. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I guess um, Lynn and Vincent presided over the wedding. So um, I, I'm sure hopefully over, over snacks and <laughs> 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 there many stories over in, the, in the reception after after um, after the lecture. So please join me in welcoming this year's awesome envi environmental policy lecture, Professor Asim Prakash. Thank you. Thanks for a lovely introduction. And as I said on Monday, it's nice to be back. And Michael McGinnis was on my dissertation committee. <laughs> so it's nice to, it's it's interesting and awkward to be on the other side of the table. It was it's quite comfortable for me. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is uh, a research program I've been engaged with for the last almost 28 years. And as with any major research programs, I have certainly contributed, but I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of some of my key associates, my key collaborators. Uh, I, I talked about the notion of a green club in my first book, my dissertation, and a couple of articles. And then I started working with Matthew Potosky. And Matt and I have done a couple of books, I think over 20, 25 articles. And uh, he's contributed enormously, both theoretically and empirically, to the evolution and development of the club idea. So I'm deeply indebted to Matt for his uh, you know, 
support and his intellectual challenge. In addition, there's several other people I've collaborated with, very important scholars, Nevis, mm -hmm. and a couple of my students who are now professors in London School of Economics, uh, Penn State, Arizona State, uh, Dan Berliner, uh, Shun Chao, Brian Greenhill, Lily Shu, and they have been very important in especially the empirical testing, but also the theoretical development of the club idea in different contexts and different programs. So I've enormously benefited from their, from their support. And then recently, recently means 10 years ago, uh, Gary Crutella wants to get in. Somebody please let him in. He was also on my committee, so I can't let him out. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's coming around this way. We have taken the club idea and applied it to the context of nonprofits. The way firms have an incentive to self-regulate or voluntarily regulate, nonprofits also face similar incentives. So we have several articles, one book, several articles, several uh, journal symposiums. I worked with Mary K. Gugerti and subsequently my student, uh, Joanne Mdebua, who is now a professor in uh, University of Maryland College Park. So I want to give a contribution to the ideas I'm going to present with. And finally, it's interesting, we're not the only game in town in talking about voluntary environmental programs, theoretically and empirically. There's a very important cadre of economists, sociologists, legal scholars, who have made very important contributions. And I have, and of course, the labels are different. Sometimes it's called private regulation, voluntary regulation, reflexive law. Every discipline has its own secrecies. But this is what Lynn once told me. So in, in governing the government, she said, I dedicate this to Vincent for his love and contestation. It's very interesting. <laughs> and once, I think Nevis and I asked her that, what is this contestation stuff? And she said, Asim, you learn a lot when people criticize you. You learn a lot when people constructively challenge you. I thought that was a very profound insight mm -hmm. that how much we are indebted to people who challenge us intellectually in a constructive manner. So I think there are shadow collaborators <laughs> that have really helped me in you know, understanding and deep, thinking deeply about this issue. They come from different disciplines. They have different theoretical interests, theoretical persuasions. They employ different kinds of empirical methods. But I think taken together, it has been a very fruitful conversation, which is on, on, ongoing. And towards the end, I'll talk about how climate change, the whole ESG stuff that has taken off, could also be fully analyzed using some of the theoretical ideas. All of you have beautiful or quite. Indiana has beautiful uh, leaves, but in Seattle, we have <laughs> lovely, lovely cherry blossoms in the month of April. <laughs> so I thought, you know, in her 1997 APSA lecture, which is really a very well written piece, Lynn said that the theory of collective action is the central subject of political science. So oftentimes, one is asked, what is political science? One could say who gets what, how, and whom. You know, that's a very classic definition, and which I think a very good definition in terms of operation of political science. But I think if you one step back, I think Lynn's insight is very profound. It is how people come together, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully, to undertake joint endeavors. And that is one of these central questions in the study of political science, political economy, and I would even venture to say in social sciences, mm -hmm. the study of collective action. From what the research program I am engaged with, my theoretical concerns are how can institutions as rule structures be designed to induce private provision of public goods? So there are different classes of social dilemmas, social problems. I'm specifically interested in private provision of public goods. And I'll explain on what I mean. And second, if this is something that's socially desirable, politically feasible, economically efficient, 
And what mechanisms can induce firms? That is what we started with. To voluntary pledge to adopt policies with non-trivial costs, which are beyond legal requirements. So there are a couple of operating words here, non-trivial costs and beyond legal requirements. So we're not talking about replacing law. It's not a libertarian conspiracy, mm -hmm. private regulation replacing public law. It is going beyond public law. And this argument or this theoretical intuition, how does it travel to the study of governments? Because governments are also participating in voluntary programs. So if you look around, the programs are everywhere. So you think about the LEED certification, a lot of buildings have LEED certification, different tiers. Oftentimes we don't realize or adequately reflect on what it means, but it is voluntary regulation sponsored by essentially a professional association of architects. Or think of MSC, Marine Stewardship Council. It's actually a collaborative program designed by Unilever and WWF. And it has had enormous impact in thinking about seafood to be voluntarily certified. In fact, Nebus is you know, in, in marine and environmental affairs, and she always reminds me that fishes only have more than 100 to 150 fisheries, voluntary programs, equal labels, things of that like. Energy Star. This is a voluntary program sponsored by, guess who? A regulator, the Environmental Protection Agency. So governments themselves with coercive capacity sponsor voluntary programs. How interesting. And we'll talk about the motivations. Or Forest Stewardship Council. This was a voluntary program established by environmental NGOs, but they have a very extensive stakeholder consultation mechanism and more than 150 million acres of forests worldwide are now certified under FC. Similarly, if you think about sustainable slopes, this is a voluntary program by US Ski Association. And essentially the idea is to uh, induce, motivate firms to adopt policies, pledge policies which are beyond the legal requirements with the object of reducing the environmental impact. Sometimes reducing pollution, sometimes that's the public good, reducing the environmental impact. But the kicker of all is, the question is, okay, why should I join voluntary program? Firms can do things on their own. Firms often have CSR reports. They make all these declarations. They donate to universities. All this is, you know, CSR, corporate social responsibility. It's a kind of voluntary regulation. So why should we come together in a group? And do we have instances of a single firm sponsoring a voluntary program and opening it up to others? And we have the big player in town called Amazon started the climate pledge and now Amazon climate pledge because Amazon is the biggest retailer of the world it certifies program which are compatible or in compliance with the climate pledge so we have a private firm that has created its own voluntary program and then asked others its suppliers and people who use that platform to use it so it's very interesting the idea of inducing firms to undertake policies beyond the legal requirements and advertising it, branding it, is quite widespread. And of course, governments themselves, especially at the city and subnational levels, are joining a voluntary program. Some would say even the Paris Agreement was a voluntary club because it was not mandatory and all the pledges are voluntary. Covenant of Mayors, that is a very popular voluntary program. In, in Europe, you can think about ICLEI, you can think of C40, you can think of voluntary programs in Norwegian cities, Norwegian municipalities. So all these are examples where administrative units, not profit-seeking entities, administrative units are joining voluntary programs because though they think if they brand themselves and if there's an audience that appreciates this branding and signal, they will get some payoff, whether it's reputational, whether it's financial, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So let's step back. Why should we care about voluntary programs? Voluntary environmental programs specifically. So carbon pollution in a given property right regime is expensive. And the assumption is if you're a profit seeking firm, you will have incentives to externalize costs because it's legally allowed. Therefore, government regulations are required 
to compel firms to internalize externalities. This is the classic narrative, and we get pushback from Gaussians and the Bloomington School. That is government the only game in town or their alternative mechanism, which I think is an important question. We don't adequately think about it. And historically, if one looks at uh, history of regulation, I think 1853 is the British Noise and Nuisance Abatement Act. It's one of the earliest pollution laws. So poll anti-pollution laws have been there for a while, at least 150 years, probably more. And of course, you know, the spate of laws enacted in the United States and other countries. So one category of government regulation, one category, but which is a very important category because of the iconic laws of 1970s, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, so on and so forth, are what is rightly or wrongly called command and control. And the basic idea is that the government would command a firm about a particular pollution reduction target and control by specifying the technology. One which is highly prescriptive, and why would the government do that? And there's a logic to it. And the logic is that it gets you quick results. You know, you tell firm what to do it and how to do it. And you back it by sanctions. And it is highly desirable for higher situations. You simply can't uh, afford the firms to have higher degrees of freedom to experiment or to comply or partially comply. And it's easy to monitor. I remember when I was doing my dissertation in late 1990s, I went to one of the facilities of the companies I'm looking at and I said, can you show me what does this Clean Air Act permitting look like? So manager this man says, okay, come. So he took me to a room probably of this size and from floor to ceiling, it was stacked. He said, because every air outlet, we have to permit it and we have to maintain paperwork. It is extremely, extremely documentation heavy. In fact, somebody, people have said that it's these environmental laws that has created the industry of environmental consultants, environmental lawyers. Because they're so legalistic, so specific, and so intensive, but they're easy to monitor. So if you have specified the technology, you really don't have to rely so much on monitoring. So most of the pollution laws actually are self-reporting. People don't realize that. Most of the data we get on pollution is self-reported data. Of course, the government goes in, monitors, enforces, you know, uh, does all those things. But self-reporting has an important role. And if you have specified that technology that would be used to self-report, it reduces monitoring costs. And command and control policy policies were very effective. In fact, some would say they were too effective. But environmental issues suddenly have become, before the climate change, less important. Because the air is now cleaner. People don't think clean air is that much of an issue, at least in 1980s and 1990s. And this has led to political demobilization, so on and so forth. So that's an important debate. Were they too successful, too quickly? And it led, uh, it diminished the issue salience for environment issues. But there is critique. So apart from the Gaussian and the Ostrom critique, firms complained, rightly or wrongly, that they imposed too many costs. Starting 1980s, there is this stream of literature on industrial industry flight hypothesis or pollution haven hypotheses because there are other jurisdictions with uh, less stringent laws that are saying, okay, come and invest here. So they are very high cost. And they are also highly reg uh, regulation intensive. There is a lot of um, bureaucratic issues that are enforced. So this is a very important thing. And an institution like EPA is now chronically underfunded. If you look at their enforcement levels, they're absolutely shocking. How few facilities the EPA is, enforce, is monitoring and enforcing. And primarily, and one contributing reason is that there is too much to enforce and monitor. And the resources haven't kept pace with this, of course. What is too much, what is too little is a matter of perception and political construction. But this is one of the critiques that's often offered. A more serious critique is that it leads to technological lock-ins. Because the government has prescribed technology. You know this, this, VAT, best available technology. And the government is not, does not have the expertise incentives to periodically revise it. And there's an element of industry capture. If you are 
an industry, you are familiar with a particular technology, why would you want it to be upgraded or revised? It's an entry barrier. In fact, that's one of the criticisms against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's, it's captured by the nuclear industry. And they have laws, they have something, uh, permitting or other, other kinds of requirements, which are kind of, uh, they're not flexible. In. So the bottom line is if you're a firm in a command and control environment where the government tells you do this and this is how you will do it, you have fewer incentives to go beyond compliance. Because you're just saying, okay, let me meet this and then let me try to make money elsewhere. Regulation is a, is a bitter pill I have to swallow. There are no incentive to actually you know, innovate and try to do things better because then I'll have to demonstrate my new technology is better than old technology and that would lead to all sorts of problems. Of course, there's a criticism here. John Nix read the famous book, Theory of Ages, 1932, where he talked about the induced innovation, that if you raise the price of inputs, there'll be incentive for profit-seeking firms to innovate. And then Porter Linda argument of 1990s, where they said that stringent but flexible regulations can actually encourage innovation because it tells firms where the waste is, what are the undesirable activities, but it gives firms uh, degrees of freedom to innovate and to move on and adopt new technology. So with the critique of command and control in 1970s and 80s gathering steam, there are a spate of new initiatives and these are just a few. I'm not even getting into torts and public interest litigation that's become so popular uh, during climate time. So one is market-based approach. Cap and trade, carbon taxes, so these have gathered a lot of traction that have been implemented in several jurisdictions. And there's a very, very extensive literature. Kerry is one of the contributors to that on how effective they are, if they're effective at all, the different designs. The second is what we call the information-based approaches. And it's, you know, just as Brandeis inside, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's an pub, a information deficit model of public policy making that most citizens, or stakeholders would like to have information, make better informed decisions. Information acquisition is costly, information processing costly. So if we feed them information in the right format, allow them to compare and contrast, they will arrive at an appropriate judgment and they'll be able to reward and punish firms as they deem fit. It's a typical information deficit model. The, the iconic initiative is what we call the Talk 6 Release Inventory Program in the United States. 1987, where they said that US manufacturing firms above a certain size are annually required to report the emission of specified emission uh, pollutants. And of course, the list has been expanding. So they've created a registry called TRI. It's available online. You can see how the firm in your neighborhood is doing. And when TRI was first established, environmental groups started public, publishing the list of what they call dirty dozens in every county. So it created a lot of furor. So I could be living next to a facility and I didn't realize that it was emitting such a toxic substance. So it kind of raised the awareness. And there are lots of anecdotal examples, statistical studies, that how it led to popular mobilization. And firms had to, or they came under pressure to decrease the emissions. The results are some, you know, find positive associations, some don't. But there is an active debate. And this information-based approach is everywhere now. Ranking and rating, starting with universities, mm -hmm. programs, companies are being ranked, countries are being ranked, ease of doing business, corruption index. Politicians uh, talk about country-level ranking all the time. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi the other day said that in ease of doing business, India has now become 65. Our aim is to become in top 50. So national level politics of a, five, of a major economy, the prime minister is talking about these scorecards that are developed by somebody somewhere using a particular methodology that even World Bank people start squabbling about and popular people quit the World Bank because they don't like the way things are happening. And finally, in the whole portfolio of these new initiatives are voluntary environmental programs, clubs, so what's the, what's the intuition 
Porter and Linde hypothesis said that stringent regulations are really not bad. They're flexible. Because they lead to cost cutting and cost saving in innovation. Kind of induced innovation. Takes with flexibility. But as, so my previous background in business, I have an MBA, I have a Procter & Gamble. It's very interesting when you, and I've been talking with firms for about 25 years now, this alone is not sufficient. It works. It's not that it doesn't work, it works. You raise input cost, it leads to innovation. In fact, Ukraine invasion, energy pricing, so much of innovation. People trying to cut down on transportation costs, use of petroleum. So it, it works, but it doesn't work as well as promised. And what is needed is some extra inducement some benefits, not only reduction in cost, but some benefits. And this is where voluntary programs come in. Because there's a cadre of firms that actually want to go beyond compliance, do well, but they want to get rewarded for that because they're profit seeking at the end of the day. Similarly, there is a cadre of stakeholders that want to reward firms that are doing well. And they don't know how to differentiate between the good performers and the bad performers. So we have a market failure. We have people who want to do good, people who want to reward who do good, but we don't have a medium, a mechanism to signal in a credible way that this actually is happening. So what is needed is a signaling mechanism for firms and a sorting mechanism for the stakeholders. Firms want to signal that, okay, we are prepared to do good. This is how we'll do, this is the program, and we want to stick our neck out. And stakeholders want to sort, okay, this firm is making this claim. It seems credible. Now I'm in a position to reward or punish it. So this is where voluntary programs come in. They're kind of solving market failure problem. And what is interesting is voluntary programs are being sponsored by a bewildering variety of actors, trade association, individual firms, governments, NGOs, collaborate endeavors, everything in between, intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, Global Compact. And for firms, typically the leader reason is that firms, especially when you are in an industry context, fear that their collective reputation will be damaged if there is one bad actor. So they want a voluntary program that everybody joins so that we collectively signal our commitment to beyond compliance policies. We come across as good citizens, responsible citizens. So we protect our collective reputations, especially big firms. Because a lot of these problems, of course, problems happen in big firms. But a lot of problems also happen because small firms don't have the capacities, the capabilities to you know, hire lawyers to do. So big firms are often very worried about the repercussions if small firms uh, don't do as well as they should. For NGOs, they see regulatory gridlock. They see regulatory failure. Government either doesn't have the capacity or the incentive to enact new regulations, so they want to enact private regulation. So it is opening the space for private politics. The governments are kind of going around the government. The NGOs are going around the government to enact new rule structures and then motivating the firms to adhere to them, to subscribe to them. It's a government failure in their perception. And the crucial issue is that clubs, because the benefits they're portraying are excludable but collective. So in a Buchanan club, the real payoff is the club good. But here the clubs, the purpose of the club is to create an environmental public good, but to reward the club members to a, a, a benefit that is excludable but collective. So it's the reputational reputation which has the characteristics of a club good. So it's slightly different from a Buchanan club on, on that count. And it needs to have a very clear branding because eventually it's a signaling and information story. Firms collectively should be able to signal. The stakeholders should be able to recognize that signal and say, okay, it's a credible signal, and we will reward and punish as we deem fit. So this is the branding, signaling, 
which is very important in our theoretical narrative. So, to borrow David Vogel's phrase, what voluntary programs are trying is to create a market for environmental virtue. Say market for virtue, we put the prefix market for environmental virtue. So clubs could be viewed as an institutional response to solve information and assurance problems. And because they are collective endeavors, the rules are more stable. If a firm individually announces a program, the firm can cancel it. So from a stakeholder, it's not a very credible commitment. But when firms collectively come together and announce a program, the costs of canceling are higher. So it becomes a more of a credible commitment. And second, if you are in that club and you want to exit it, you say, okay, we've noticed you. So it's easy for NGOs and others to target their scorn on the exitors, the defectors. Which means if you're a firm and if you're invited to join a club, you'll say, okay, I can join a club. What is the cost? And if I don't like it, if I exit, what will be the consequences? And how do I know how the rules are made? How do I know the rules will not be suddenly changed opportunistically? So there are lots of questions that firms ask because the cost sometimes are not that serious, but oftentimes they are. And you know, in the Q and A's, I can talk more about how firms think about the whole voluntary program club uh, dynamics. Second advantage of doing this collectively as well as individually is that when a lot of companies join a club, then economies of scale in producing a reputation. Think of a language. When few people speak language, the willingness of an individual to learn that language are fewer because the economic payoffs are fewer. But if you have a very large population speaking the same language and I'm able to join that language group, my payoffs are higher. So clubs, in the sense, if it is well-established brand name, a lot of people know it, then there's a greater incentive to join it. Of course, there could be a crowding problem. There could be a contamination problem, optimal club size. Those are important issues, and we can talk about that. But these are the dynamics like individual companies specifically, but also governments have an incentive to join a collective endeavor instead of signaling their environmental virtues individually. However, clubs have lots of problems. All institutions fail. Markets fail, governments fail, nonprofits fail. So if you're looking for that magic solution, there aren't any. And I think as a social scientist, what our job is to identify what the problems are, to anticipate what the problems are. And if possible, put in corrective, no matter how imperfect, because progress is incremental. So what are the major criticisms? One is, it's very easy to sponsor a club. There's overpopulation of club. There are too many clubs, there are too many eco labels, and there's an information overload. So stakeholders are not able to differentiate the good from the bad. And green washes, you know, very flimsy clubs, coexist with more credible clubs. And the way you know bad money chases out good money, here you know bad clubs kind of put negative reputational externalities on good clubs. So this is a very serious issue. Greenwashing is serious. Companies making false claims is serious. And even you know we like private regulation, voluntary action. We have to be cognizant that there could be some strategic interactions here. There could be misrepresentation here. This happens all the time. Second is a deeper philosophical issue that are these voluntary initiatives going to weaken public regulation, especially the demand for public regulation. So if public feels that you know, firms are able to self-regulate in a decent way, would they be less insistent on demanding that new laws would be enacted? So one can debate the virtues of public regulation, voluntary regulation, but this is an important concern with people, amongst people, and that's a very large number of them, who think it's important to have laws, high, highly stringent laws, and then let companies go beyond them. Let's not put a low bar for public regulation. And this is an important argument to consider. And finally, it's a democracy deficit. Public regulation, I know democracy is in retreat all over the place. People are very worried and for right reasons. But still, when you make public regulation, some people feel there is at least some level of democratic participation. 
I know it's highly questionable. Most of the world is not in not living in democracies. It is the economy of the world. China is not a democracy. But given the distrust of business, especially in America, people think that voluntary regulation enhances democracy deficit. Because you don't know who's making these laws. Amazon climate pledge. Did Amazon ask us what we want? Who elected Jeff Bezos to decide how the world should function? And I think these are legitimate questions. I'm not saying we will all agree on the answers, but we have to ask these questions. We believe in democracy. Who is, you know, it's, it's, it's a classic IID issue that rules to make rules, but who's empowered particular individuals to have the gatekeeping rules to make rules? And I think this is a, a very important issue. So clubs comes in various shapes and sizes and stripes. And what we have done is we had looked we looked at two, what we think are important analytic dimensions. What makes a club attractive? What makes the club effective? These are the questions we ask. And essentially, kind of motivated by design principles, there are two important issues. One is, what, how much does it cost to enter a club and to maintain the membership? What we call standards. And once you've entered, what are the monitoring, enforcement, and compliance costs? Because shocking is a problem. And there are different kinds of clubs in this two by two matrix. And you could say low, medium, high. We can have different permutations, combinations. But the point I'm trying to make is clubs are of different kinds in terms of the institutional design. And these institutional designs have implications and very interesting ones. So think of cell one, one, top left. Standards, so these are what we we'll call green washes. They really don't impose very high cost. Standards are very lenient. And monitoring is perfunctory. These are low cost curves and low repetition clubs. A lot of people join them because they're so low cost. Or a lot of people join them, a lot of firms join them because the repetition is also low. Or in contrast, think of a high cost club, sells 2-2. It's very high cost because the standards they impose are very stringent. The mechanisms to monitor the swords are pretty you know, stringent as well. But because they are so stringent, they have high reputation. So different firms would gravitate toward different cells depending on what they want out of this governance system. Some would want low cost, low reputation. Some would, so some sorting would go on. And one of the interesting questions that is often asked is what kind of firms gravitate toward different kinds of clubs. And having joined these clubs, do they improve their economic performance? Because if clubs are only sorting and not shaping behavior, then they're less effective. The classic endogeneity problem. That in the high, in the two to club, high cost, high reputation, if you attract top performing firms, after joining the club, they're not going to improve their environmental performance because they're always at, at the top. You'll say the club is ineffective because there is no improvement. So, would you rather invest your energy in C21, where standards are lower, you get mediocre firms, but you are able to improve their performance? So, these are policy relevant and interesting questions because who joins is endogenous to or is determined by or influenced by how the club is designed and what kind of benefit cost combination. It promises. Okay. So if we step back, there are essentially four collective action issues that influence club effectiveness. And we talked about these different issues in different paper, and I'm just going to give you a sample of that. So the first challenge is emergence challenge. Why would an actor invest resources to create a collective endeavor. That's the basic problem. Why, would, why don't people free ride? And the answer is, this actor must get something out of it. Either it's a privileged group, that although you're creating a collective benefit, individually you still benefit so much that you're willing to pick up the cost. And this is the story for many trade associations. That the big firms in that trade association, whether it's forestry, whether it's uh, chemicals, said we need 
an industry wide voluntary environmental program. Because we have to protect our collective reputation. If less well managed firms have an industrial accident, it will impose enormous harm. So we are willing to contribute expertise. Our lawyers will work with you, our managers will to design what a voluntary program would look like, how it will be managed, and then we have to make sure everybody joins it. So emergence challenge is very important. NGOs, I said that they are very frustrated. They can't get public law. I think there's regulatory failure. In fact, the federal government recently had not enacted a major environmental law since 1990. Assuming IRA is supposed to be an environmental law. So NGOs have an incentive because they have an audience to cater to. NGOs have a constituency there to show they're getting something done. And one way NGOs get things done is to enact a new rule system. And then kind of motivate, incentivize, sometimes coerce, you know, legally, of course, wants to join it. Similarly, governments, you know, there's a gridlock situation because of different parties that control different branches of the government. So the regulator says, you know what, let's establish a voluntary program. We can do it through executive order, or we can just, you know, we don't have to go through the Congress to authorize it. So William Riley, who initiated this in 1990s, essentially that is what the logic was. That let's have voluntary programs. Of course, the important thing is why did the dog not bark? And this is an area that people have not looked at adequately, non-emergence. So there are certain conditions that lead us to expect that there'll be a voluntary program that would emerge. There's a collective repetition, which is threatened. There's a privileged group. And yet we don't see a voluntary program emerging. That is an important question to us. So we have kind of a truncated dependent variable problem here because very few people have talked about the non-emergence. And a classic example is the deep water horizon accident. We've just published a paper on that. So all industry after that accident did not establish a voluntary program. This chemical industry after Bhopal established responsible care. And the conditions are very similar. And what our paper shows is that essentially there were no reputational spillovers beyond business petrol. So there was very little, you know, one is talking about reputational spillovers uh, for BV to, uh, to uh, for other oil firms to take initiative and create a voluntary program that would up the level of regulation voluntarily and be a credible signal. The second challenge is why should firms join it, especially the ones which have non trivial costs? So we call it the recruitment challenge. And this is probably the most discussed, examined, empirically tested issue in the study of voluntary environmental programs. Who joins the program, when and how? People also join, you know, there's variation in space and time. Firms join at different points in time. What are the uh, carrots and sticks? So essentially, in some industries, like chemical industry, we mandated voluntary, uh, we mandated participation. So it was not voluntary, in the sense of uh, uh, absence of coercion. Of course, the, some firms left the trade association because they didn't want that mandate. But what we have been finding, or what the literature reports, is pressure from economic pressures, normative pressures, NGO pressures that are allowing or that are motivating firms to join these programs. So let me give you some examples. In a paper, uh, Race to the Bottom, what we find is when importing countries have high environmental uh, salience, where environmental issues have high salience there, or where the stock of ISO 14001, which is a voluntary program, is very high, the exporting countries have an incentive or the firms and exporting countries have an incentive to join this program. So it's the pull of the importer, it's a classic California effect, David Vogel kind of an argument, where importing country is kind of influencing the regulatory, even voluntary regulation mindset of the exporting country. Then investing up, here we looked at the same idea, but looked at the role of foreign direct investment. And what we find is, Investment from China has a very different implication for local environmental politics than investment from Scandinavia or US. So if you get investment from countries where multinationals are heavily into ISO standards, then in the investing countries, 
the home and the host country, host countries, we see a higher level of ISO 14. So they're trading up, it was investing up. Then Nimitz and I did this paper where we found that cities are more likely to join governance of mayor when they have a very strong stock of NGOs. So number of NGOs, the duration of the time of which they have existed. So NGOs play a very important role in putting pressure on the political unit to join a voluntary program. How interesting. And finally, the paper I did with Dan Berliner, that if you're a firm, which is very careful about environmental issues, but you are working in a country which has very poor environmental record, how do you persuade your overseas buyers that you're actually a good person? So we, what we find is that firms that come from highly corrupt countries or countries with very poor environmental enforcement are more likely to join ISO, especially when they're exporting to markets where environmental issues are taken very seriously. So it becomes a signaling mechanism to differentiate, to purge yourself from country of origin factors. You want to run away from that. So there are different motivations for joining something like ISO. The second is shocking and efficacy challenge that, you know, one could join a club and not adhere to its requirements. And it's not a legal obligation. Nobody would put you in jail. There's no enforcement action. I'll not be fined. So there's an enormous temptation to free ride. And in our narrative, we've, we've you know, described, analyzed different kinds of monitoring, you know, information disclosures, first party auditing, third, second party auditing, third party auditing, and sometimes expulsion, what we call SWATs. These all raise the costs, raise the risks for the firms. And the issue is, do they improve performance even after addressing the indulgent issues? So in covenant with weak swords, ISO 14,000, we said is weak swords because they're not expelling people. We actually find, even after addressing indulgent issues, firms that join ISO 14,001 actually pollute less. In blue washing the firm, Firms that joined Global Compact actually did worse. And that is because Global Compact, we said, is a very, very big club. It doesn't have any monitoring at all. So monitoring becomes very important in curbing shocking. And in paper in ecological economics, EPA had launched a program called 3350, which expired in 1995. And what we found, there's a legacy effect. Firms that joined 3350, even after the program had expired, continue to outperform the firms that had not joined 2350. That means the new practices, the new technologies, the new systems you incorporate, when you join the club, outlive the life of the club. Because it changes the internal dynamics on how firms think about pollution. Alongside, in efficacy, we've also done a lot of work on spillover effects. The club wants to do X, but it might have an effect on why. So in green clubs and voluntary governance, we find that firms that join ISO 14001 actually also show superior compliance with public law. This is not only reducing pollution, they're also complying better with public law. In signaling climate resilience in municipal board market, my student in, in, in Wauko and I, we find that firms when they join adaptation focused clubs as opposed to mitigation focused clubs, actually get improved credit rating in the bond market. Because bonds are rewarding cities that have invested in climate resilience, not climate mitigation. So they actually get a reward on that. In voluntary regulation and innovation, Si Jong Lim, she's um, my student, now she's a professor in Korea. We find that when firms join, join ISO 14001, they are also more innovative. So we find kind of portal lender hypothesis being supported in the voluntary sector. And finally, uh, got, when firms join something called ISO 9000, which is a sister program on quality control, they actually improve the labor practices. So the bottom line is when we start thinking about efficacy, we have to think about multiple different variables. Because there's a direct effect and there's a spillover and indirect effect. And the final challenge is stakeholder shocking. What do I mean by that? In a market for environmental virtue, the firms say we'll be good with the expectation that they'll be rewarded. What if stakeholders don't reward? For a variety of reasons. Stakeholders may free ride. It's that whole tipping thing. 
that during COVID, you were taking takeouts, you were not sure, should it be 18% or 10%? And how are the restaurants calculating the wages? What is the resumption? So it could, of course, lead to overtipping, but it might lead to undertipping. So maybe stakeholders don't understand what they're expected to do. What do firms expect them to do? But there is some work on eco-labels that people who are claimed to be highly environmental conscious still may not be willing to pay a premium for eco-labels. There's an attitude behavior gap, which is well documented in the literature. Second is that, you know, there's information overload. People are getting bombarded with so much information. This is good. This is bad. This is better. That's, they simply don't have the cognitive capacity to differentiate. So expecting stakeholders will rise up and reward you is being unrealistic, especially at the consumer level. Maybe in financial markets, where the stakeholders are more sophisticated, they have the talent, they have the skills, we may get a different outcome. So this is, I think, is one of the important areas of future research in this voluntary environmental programs that do firms get the reward they expect? Or why don't stakeholders, whether it's governmental, non-governmental, reward firms for doing good? So as I said, we've also extended this study to non-profit regulation, non-profit voluntary regulation. And we've done a couple of uh, papers that are essentially using the same ideas say nonprofits have the same reputational concerns as firms and they want to signal to their own stakeholders whether it's donors regulators especially in the you know, in the wake of the oxfam scandal that they are good actors and they're performing as for charter so to, to conclude what, what exactly is the big picture here theoretically so one as you know lynn has always reminded us there is the emphasis on institutional monoculture is not a good idea. What you need is institutional layering, institutional contestations. You have multiple centers of regulation of collective action. So voluntary programs kind of extends that Ostrom idea of polycentricity of institution multiculture in the era of regulating firms, regulating governments. And they, while we say this, we realize that there's tremendous heterogeneity. So the way not all governments are like, the good governments and bad governments. Governments fail, governments succeed. Same with voluntary programs have tremendous heterogeneity. So as scholars and as practitioners, they have to understand what drives this heterogeneity. And as an institutionalist, my interest is in institutional design. I think design, design matters. It's not the whole story, but design matters. Whether you have high standards, low standards, it attracts different kinds of firms and it reduces or it improves their environmental performance accordingly. So getting hung up on what is the best design, you know, sometimes I get pushed back. Can you tell me what is the best design? I said, I cannot. Because there is no best design. Design matters in, in a particular context. If you are in a developing country where overall regulation is very low and you want a very high cost club, it will fail because people are not used to that. So you have to start small and then incrementalism, ratchet it up. It has to be sequencing. You first try something low cost, make people comfortable, raise the cost. So hoping for that perfect design, whether it's you know perfect electoral design or perfect this design, this I don't think is a very fruitful social inquiry. Because at the end of the day, as Vincent would remind us, we are artisans. We're constantly experimenting. And we're changing. We're trying to see what works better. Sometimes it works better. It gets obsolete. So we change again. So in some ways, this fluidity is important. And that would that is my perspective on voluntary program. That it is a series of experimentations. It's an ongoing project like other institutions. And there are some areas of future research, and I'll not even get into climate change now. So one is, why are clubs emerging in certain areas and not others? We have a couple of uh, ideas in mind. I'm happy to talk about that. And second, as we talk, there's a massive structural shift happening in the global economy for the last 20 years. Since China joined the WTO, 
in the year 1999. And China has a status perspective. Wendy is an expert on China. So my, might this rise of statism affect the incentives to undertake voluntary action? The voluntary programs are popular in China, but all of them are inspired by Western worries, Western, Western ideas. And I think this is very important. We still haven't kind of teased out how the structural rise of China is going to affect domestic politics. We talked about China shock and so on and so forth, but in, in, a, in a deeper way, how we think about regulation, how we think about the state. Then is what club participants do will it spill over their supply chains, which are spread all over the world in areas where there is poor governance capacity, where there's rampant state failure. Would these non-participants also get motivated, incentivized to adopt superior strategies? I'm interested in environmental issues. I've also written on labor issues, human rights issues, gender issues. So it is a range of issues where we're using economic networks to influence social norms, to influence social practices across issue areas. This is again an empirical question. We don't know. Oftentimes we think trade always has negative consequences and sometimes trade does have negative consequences. The plunder of Congo because of cobalt is a very classic example, but sometimes trade can also result in positive things. And I have some interesting anecdotes to share in the queue. And finally, Mike and I were having this discussion on Monday. The discourse now has become very structural. The space for agency, individual initiative at the level of individual, at the level of small organizations, communities has shrunk. And when we talk about voluntary programs, this is kind of an agentic response to some governance deficits, real or perceived. So in this structuralist environment where everything is about structure, Everybody wants policy by the federal government. Even state government is not okay now, by the federal government. What intellectual space do we have for voluntary programs, for agentic initiatives, for people coming together, not hoping the federal government will come in and rescue them, but in a small little ways, in small little spaces, can we do better? So that intellectual space, I worry, is shrinking. So there's a, there's a broader normative concern as I look at governance portfolios in the future. So let me stop now. Vinay and I'll have a check of things online. Sure. We have about, be about 20 folks online. Okay. Well, online already. Um, but so maybe, yeah. That was There's a stop sharing. I think we could stop sharing. Yeah, let's stop sharing. Great. Wonderful. Is that Allison that had a question? Look at the chat. Maybe it was just applause. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat just yet. So maybe we'll you want to take questions from the room then. So I was interested in the stakeholder shirking. Um, and I was thinking about I like to call stakeholders citizens. So I'm interested in why we call them stakeholders. But uh, the firms, don't, aren't the stakeholders paying higher prices? So maybe the other actors should reward the firms, like the governments that aren't providing the institutional or regulatory structures. So if the firms are voluntarily providing them, it seems like the stakeholders are paying right? Because they're paying higher prices for the firms to voluntarily do all this. Right. So stakeholders include customers, but they can also include regulators. Okay. They can, they can pertain to any actor that has a stake in how the firm works. Okay. Regarding, are consumers willing to pay higher prices for ethical products? So if you, as I read the fair trade and other literature, they're not. 
the market share of ethically produced products is very, very small. So one way to think is shareholders shocking. And the interesting thing is, so this is the attitude, the attitude behavior gap. There's a huge literature. If you ask people about attitudes and their preferences, that's of course he supported environmental issues. Of course, we, there should be climate action. But when you ask them, are you willing to pay for it? There's a huge gap. In our lovely state of Washington, which is a blue state, we've had two carbon tax referendums, 2016 and 2018. The first referendum was led by an environmental NGO, a newcomer, and all the traditional environmental NGOs ganged up against it to defeat it. It lost 43-57. The second in, uh, referendum in 2018, was led by mainstream environmental NGOs. It also lost by the similar margin. In a time when Maria Cantwell, who was running for Senate, got about 56, 57% vote. So in our lovely state of Washington, which is green, everybody is gung-ho about climate change. We are not willing to vote for a climate tax, which is pretty modest, $30 a ton. 3-0. And you know, rising everywhere. So there is a gap between what people say and what people do. That's the story about fair trade. That's a trade of you know, story of many ethical labels. Organics are different because organics are promising private benefits. So there's a greater market for organics. But the moment you have public benefits, there's a shrinkage of what people are willing to. Maybe it's because you know they're economically stressed. So I'm not kind of you know uh, saying people are bad. People have their own concerns. Well, analytically, there's a gap between what people claim and what they want and what they're willing to pay for it. Yes, uh, see, um, I think this might be consistent with one of your um, explanations, but um, just classically, uh, public good provision by the public sector gives one level for everybody, like one ambient air quality standard. So that means by definition, there are a lot of winners and losers. And um, losers, um, well, actually it's a lot of losers because there's only one you know, set of preferences that's exactly satisfied. So you have basically a lot of dissatisfied people. Some people want more stringent air quality, some people want less. Um, and there's a literature in the risk field about the psychological consequences of involuntary impositions. So you might have, for example, the two pack a day cigarette smoker that opposes the siting of a nuclear power plant 20 miles away. So if you think in that terms, it means that public policy inevitably is going to dissatisfy a lot of people and are going to feel as feel as if they're being forced to consume something at a level they don't want. With that as a um, sort of perspective, I'm wondering if the voluntary um, sector could be seen as a way, a way for the folks that, let's say, are losers from an air quality standard that want more stringent, more environmental provision, to so get together voluntarily to kind of go beyond to do what they want in a way that is um, harmonious and psychologically you know, comfortable. Very interesting. So in nonprofit field, this is called the preference heterogeneity hypothesis. And the idea is exactly what you've said. The government provides a particular kind of public good aimed at the median citizen. But there are people whose preferences are not at the median. So this preference heterogeneity. And these people say, we want an, another vendor to supply us the same public service, whether it's education, whether it's daycare, whether it's requirements. And that's the demand side hypothesis of why nonprofits emerge. So they're cutting to multiple preferences that a typical government policy is not catering to. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense. If I have very strong pro environmental preferences, the government is not supplying environmental policy at the level I want. I want to increase the demand for more stringent regulation. So I start donating to an environmental nonprofit. So instead of individually lobbying, we collectively lobby nonprofit because of my agent, and I expect nonprofit to translate my political preferences into lobbying and hopefully get a level of regulation that's more in conformity 
in my preferences. I completely agree. Absolutely. The other sort of related thing is, is that I'm wondering that if your work as a generality beyond just voluntary environmental agreements into a larger literature on nonprofits. Yes. So nonprofits is also voluntary provision of yeah. public goods, right? Yeah. So I'm voluntarily donating somebody to pursue my political preferences. So it is, you're absolutely, I think, you know, that's exactly what the theoretical argument is that when we don't get our preferences satisfied in the regular governance process, we want to go around it or above it. So either we join voluntary programs as firms, or we want firms to join voluntary programs, or we create a lobbying structure that induces governments or firms to raise their level of regulation. Absolutely. We have a question from uh, the chat. Um, Taiho asks, how do we respond to the dependency and financial burden to the primary producers, in this case farmers, in an agricultural supply chain created by the required adoption of voluntary standards such as Rainforest Alliance, UTZ, et cetera? Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. In fact, that's uh, it's not only true for farmers, it's also true for smaller firms. And what we have found in our research is that weaker firms that are not financially very strong are very, very of new requirements imposed by overseas suppliers. In fact, I've, I've, I've known a couple of friends in India who are entrepreneurs, and one of them wanted to become uh, a supplier to an American automobile company. He contacted them, and they said, oh, that's okay, please fill out this questionnaire. He was not even a supplier. And in that supplier questionnaire, one of the issues was, do you have ISO 14001 certification? what is this ISO 40? So he started investigating and he quickly realized that the costs are too much and the hassle is too much. So the argument you're seeing in the context of farmers, and I've heard this, especially in the context of fair trade, that the certification requirements seem onerous and they simply don't have the margin to support this new regulatory cost to get themselves certified. So they kind of opt out because the regulatory environment is stringent. I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. So, uh, Harry's uh, question raised, raised the issue of a single unitary government standard, but it's not just about whether the standard reflects a particular person's political preferences, right? There's also a, a scientific aspect to where it's set. Of course, it's not the only way government regulation works. So if you go to the Clean Water Act, uh, the water quality standards are set by the states and can be differentiated by water source. Right? So you can have dirty water and you, you know standards and clean water standards. And so in, in that case, I wonder, does it get more complicated or uh, voluntary programs to do better when there's more than one governmental standard involved. So you're talking about standards by state government and federal government? Or? Well, so yeah, so if, in the case of the Clean Water Act, it's the federal government has obviously its, its emission uh, effluent requirements, but water quality standards are set separately by the states and the states can have a lot of leeway to determine what waters should be cleaner than other waters, right? Some waters can be designated for industrial effluents, for example. So I'm wondering in that kind of case, does it become harder for the voluntary sector to actually find a role? Right, so there are multiple standards and you want to go beyond compliance, what's the baseline you're looking at? Are you looking at the federal baseline? Or are you looking at uh, the state level baseline, and if you are a cheater, you would say I'll take the lower baseline. <laughs> I declare myself to be you know, environmentally virtuous because I'm I'm beyond compliance. It's just that you know I could do you know jurisdiction shopping, and I shopped for the for the lowest or least stringent jurisdiction. I've not heard that story, but I think the hog industry, which is under a lot of pressure, and with North Carolina you know, having ridiculously low standards, as I understand. Mm -hmm. This could be a very interesting case study. 
because I expect Smithfield and others to respond because they're getting so much of bad press, including the latest book called Wasteland. I don't know if you people have read it. It's, it's worth reading. It's, it's horrific, but it's very educating. The level of pollution, unchecked pollution taking place from hop farms. Uh, I think this is really interesting. I have not encountered anybody talking about this issue. There is jurisdictional uh, shopping when it comes to international issues. But typically what happens is like FSC, Forest Stewardship Council, they, the, the voluntary program stipulates the highest standards, not the lowest standards. So that is typically what is happening. But I, I, I see the point you're making. The green washers could do the new standard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nimes had your hand. Well, I was just going to add in Washington state, we have federal regulation, we have state regulation when it comes to water pollution. Yet we have at least two voluntary programs that address water pollution, right? One is salmon safe agriculture. So we have salmon safe uh, wine. And then we have salmon safe construction, for example, say salmon safe um, parking lots so that you reduce the runoff. So yes, of course, there's federal, there's state regulation, there's county regulation, yet we do have at least two voluntary clubs. But those are for activities that are not regulated, right? So you have the regulation on the affluent on the point sources, but then as a good citizen, you say, I'm going to voluntarily contribute for my non-point source pollution. Um, so further complicating the, yeah, exactly. the, the potpourri of institutions. Well, also, there's also right the issue of secondary regulation, aside from the governmental regulation. So sometimes the government, or, uh, so for example, hazardous waste facilities, uh, the, legal, the federal requirements, among other things, require them to obtain insurance. So the insurance industry is drafted as a secondary regulator. So now you've got private regulation as well as public regulation prior to any really opportunity for voluntary action, right? So it, it adds another layer. Yeah, it's another layer. And there's another twist to it. So correct me if I'm wrong. So when there's an industrial accident, there are compensatory damages and punitive damages. But the bar for punitive damage is very high. You have to demonstrate there was new, dili no new diligence. There is some kind of, you know, uh, deliberateness. And what I have found in the last 25 years, one of the important motivators, especially for high risk industry is, if you join voluntary programs, you demonstrate due diligence. And, 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 you, and you get monitored less. You get, uh, that is disputable. Oh, is it? So EPA wanted to give regulatory relief. There was a huge, huge pushback. Oh, okay. So the National Environments, uh, Environmental Performance Track Program that was continued. It was okay. offering regulatory yeah. relief in lieu of joining credible one two programs such as 14001. But at least in big firms, because what they fear is really punitive, not compensatory. And this becomes a convenient way to demonstrate due diligence. Because they're very process-based programs. So yeah. So legal system plays a very important role. That SWOT is hanging in the background, especially in the American context. And a lot of firms are actively thinking especially in the chemical sector, you know, mm -hmm. where industrial accidents are not uncommon, that how can we prevent our damages, especially punitive damages, being imposed on us? Oh, please. Okay. My turn. Uh, I seem might be interested to hear what you, you're thinking about this uh, rise in China's role in the world economy and how that's going to affect uh, the, the viability of these kinds of voluntary associations. So I've been trying to work it out in my own mind here. I can see how it's somehow China's rise would somehow offset the agent based sort of agency sort of based um, uh, kind of a tool that sort of lies on individual agency. But on the other hand, it might just signal a, a shift to a different kind of virtue signal that there would be different virtues that might be um, desirable to demonstrate in a system where China has more of a role in the global economy. But, but how are you sort of thinking about what the rise of China is gonna mean for, um, for this kind of voluntary action? So we've done two papers, Christopher Adolf, he's my colleague. We call it the Shanghai effect. 
that how is the rise of China in the global political economy, specifically as a global trading uh, power, is affecting domestic politics in labor, in human rights, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is David Vogel and others had argued, and some of our research, actually David's initial work in Egypt, I think it's an Egypt newspaper, right? Based the bottom. So essentially the idea is if you're a jurisdiction that's importing a lot of stuff, and you mandate a particular regulation, then companies would say, you know what, I export 20% of my cars to California. Why don't I make California compliant cars for everybody? Instead of having a differentiated product, a California compliant product, a non-California compliant product. So essentially, California becomes the de facto national regulator. And that's why the Trump administration wanted to withdraw that power extended under the Clean Air Act to California to set its own emission standards, tail pipe emission standards. So California and Germany in the context of Europe had this enormous market power to diffuse their norms, their standards, their environmental standards to the rest of the world. And what we show is that this is happening in environmental issues. Brian Greenhill, Lena Mosley, and I published in APSR about 10, 15 years ago, same dynamics are happening in labor. And Shun, uh, Brian, and I published in BJPS, same things happening in human rights. And that is because the major economies in the world were Western economies where human rights, labor rights were valued a lot. And any company that misbehaved allegedly or in real terms got bad publicity, there was an enormous pressure to sanction. And if not, companies and countries were under tremendous pressure to get sanctioned. So Western world could impose, export its values, norms, because of its economic dominance in global trade. So what we say is, okay, West is on decline. China is on the rise. China is the biggest investor in Africa and Latin America. Massive investments. And New York Times, you know, every month has a new story about this new railway line which is so dysfunctional, blah, blah, blah. China is being made blame for debt crisis in Sri Lanka, so and so forth. So this rise of China, what we call the Shanghai effect, is it affecting the global normative diffusion? And Mike is adding another layer to it, that in terms of the governance portfolio we think of, how do we govern ourselves? Spread of voluntary self-regulatory mechanisms, not described by the central government. So there are different governance models. And every governance model has a particular theory behind it. And I would think yes. And the reason is Chinese foreign direct investors, when they come in, they have a very different dynamics mm -hmm. from Western. By West, I'm including Scandinavian, British, mm -hmm. German, and American investors. When, and it's not because anybody is good or bad. They come from very different cultural and political contexts. And when you're trading, you're not only exchanging goods and services, you're exchanging ideas. Mm -hmm. You're educating each other in good norms and bad norms. So my fear is we found that if you trade more with China, you're more likely to enact restrictive NGO laws. This is Rolf and I have just published in NVSQ. Yeah. Yeah. If you trade more with China, and of course, you know, we, we have a slightly, so we are, it's not trading with China. We talk about changing ceilings of trade with China and who's replacing blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's slightly more complicated than what I'm describing. But essentially the idea is, yeah, at the margin, it is making a difference. At the moment, the, the shift is not that dramatic. And a lot of these countries are still kind of working with Western institutions, Western values. They still think democracy is important. Elections are important. But once we go through two, three cycles where you rig an election, you're not getting sanctioned, mm -hmm. you're not getting the international opprobrium, mm -hmm. and there's one model that comes down from Beijing. And I think self-regulation, voluntary regulation, institutional layering would probably suffer. It's a very non-Tokelian world, Maoist world. Mm -hmm. yeah, so listening to this exchange makes me Think, I think we, if we think in terms of governance rather than government, right, then we can talk about voluntary imposition or acceptance within a polity of environmental protection restrictions, right? And so the difference then between the government and some the government and some other group 
taking on these responsibilities um, will become less different. And where I want to highlight this, the climate context, one of the questions I've been pondering for several years now, in the climate context, California especially, but also the EU, are voluntary actors. I mean, all countries are voluntary actors when it comes to NDCs and, and all of that. California and the EU are taking big first mover risks, bearing lots of costs to be first movers. The question is why? And I'm wondering if that, if we're asking that same question with respect to uh, pollution sources that become first movers in developing the kind of voluntary groups that you were talking about. I'm, I'm wondering about the, I mean, obviously the motivation has to do with something about uh, political culture uh, in different places, but you know, from a, from a strictly economic point of view, it, it's quite questionable whether what California has been doing <laughs> is smart policy, even though from a climate change perspective, it's great. So it's a complicated question. Let me offer some ideas. Why is EU a climate leader? So there is a lot of political science work on this. And one interesting argument is what you said, political culture. And the argument that is made is that the EU, when it has emerged, it has to legitimize itself. Mm -hmm. States have legitimized themselves through wars. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, as my, Tilly has reminded us, you know, war makes states and states make war. How does EU as a supra-state legitimize itself? So one of the ways they have legitimized themselves is environmentalism, because it's widely popular domestically. So this is one argument. Of course, the argument is holes, because the same EU now with Ukraine invasion is suddenly forgetting environmentalism. They're restarting coal plants building expensive LNG infrastructure with an economic life of 40, 50 years, and there goes your environmentalism. So this environmentalism is fragile if gas prices rise very high. But still, I think there is something to be said about how domestic politics is shaping national level positions on climate issues. The second is, if you're the first mover, you can actually shape standards. I think the EU definitely wanted to do that. That happened in the chemical sphere. But you Definitely. know, EU also takes two steps forward and one backward. Mm -hmm. So now they want to talk about border taxes. They were very gung-ho about climate change and rightly so. And we enact these aggressive climate policies and suddenly realize they're losing jobs. So then you start putting in walls. So I think it is interesting, and this is politics. Mm -hmm. no, I don't blame them. at least they try. They may not have gone the full, you know, 20 yards or 30 yards. At least they went some, yeah. and they became a role model, ETS, EU ETS, with all its problems, oversupply, this and that. It is still functioning. It is still expanding. It's an experiment worth thinking about. And they didn't want emissions trading to begin with. Yeah. So I think there is a lot to be said about European environmentalism mm -hmm. and the cohesion they've been able to maintained on environmental issues in spite of a lot of exogenous shocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is economic, cultural, political, including bureaucratic objectives, survivability of the EU as a, as a system, mm -hmm. as a bureaucracy. Lauren has been, you have been waiting very- No, 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 others who haven't chimed in. Oh, sorry, Jessica. Oh, um, okay, really, really quick, uh, sort of a uh, question about the fact that you said you've also looked at sort of labor as well as human rights and my, Sort of I'm trying to keep it a short question is to what extent do you think that some of the specific collective action um, aspects of club model that you've discussed vary across domains? So one would expect, for instance, that technology, uh, Sarah Barlow just reminded me that technology is especially important and costly in environment, slightly less relevant in the context of labor. And so in thinking about when and how firms join these clubs. How do these different domains likely shape those dynamics? And similarly, if firms have to be part of more than one club in this way, mm -hmm. 
we expect there to be trade-offs between investing in environmental standards versus labor standards versus human rights standards, given that they're all costly investments. Excellent. So is the politics of joining clubs in labor, human rights, environment different? Absolutely. And one important difference is the cultural context. So when you talk about human rights in an expansive way and you include gender rights, you include say LGBT rights, you get a push off from some countries, push back from some countries, because culturally it's a very different narrative. Environmental issues on that count are relatively, relatively devoid of normative contestations. Everybody would like this pollution. So I think on that count, this is an easy case to think about efficient voluntary programs. I would expect, uh, especially gender, to have a much uh, a higher level of contestation on the subject. And your second question is? Trade-offs among these trade -offs. You know, Nobody's looked at this issue. That's a very interesting issue. Mm -hmm. My intuition is that there is that latent variable of corporate CSR propensity that makes corporations go, do better here, do better here, and do better there. So I think it's the same corporate core, the corporate philosophy, and how we want to deal with various societal pressures, societal opportunities, ESG, for lack of a better word, that would make firms not in terms of trade-offs, but in terms of complementarities. And what we do, in, because our environmental image reinforces our social image, reinforces our governance image. We are good firms, so there are no trade-offs. So that is my intuition, but you're absolutely right, because this is exactly the issue in the ESG debate, that you say ESG, but are e -S -E -S -N -G always working the same way or are they working against each other? Especially when you see variation between firm investments across Absolutely. these laws. Yeah. I was just, I just wanted to add something. A French firm would respond differently than a British firm, than an American firm, because labor law is so much, so much more stringent in France. So for them joining a labor club would really not bring any benefits and state regulates everything. So in yeah. addition to the different industries would also be the different countries. Yeah, I'll actually add to that. Nevis is absolutely right. Uh, this is the literature in business strategy called implicit versus explicit CSR. And the puzzle is why are European uh, firms less gung-ho about corporate social responsibility? And they said that's because all these issues are being taken care of by public regulation. Mm -hmm. it's implicit CSR. So that means there is a very interesting relationship between public law and private law. Mm -hmm. And private law is essentially doing or filling in the regulatory deficit, which is a status argument that, you know, if you provide public law, which is sufficient, then you don't need CSR. But then Kerry's argument comes in that people have different preferences. People have different preferences to public law. So in a heterogeneous pr political preference environment, is there still an intellectual and policy space or different kinds of voluntary programs that are catering to these heterogeneous preferences. I just add, I, I think people have different aversions to involuntary positions too. Mm -hmm. And that would explain a larger regulatory state in France than yes. it's in the US. And therefore, the hypothesis might be that voluntary actions would be more compatible with the US system than, than the French. Yeah, not in the... Tocqueville's country of birth, but Tocqueville's country of travel. <laughs> I'm just going to say, sort of going off of what uh, Jess was asking to some extent. Um, so I was thinking about how these clubs and joining the clubs, how the costs are relatively larger for some actors relative, relative to others. So if it's a country-based club, developing countries they have to sort of pay a larger relative cost. Same with small firms or developing country firms. And to me, it seems like these clubs could in some cases sort of reinforce inequalities, existing inequalities to the detriment of developing countries or firms in developing countries in the same way that helping development, developing countries to higher standards for let's say electrification. Um, it's causing some problems for some countries. Absolutely. So this is the entry barriers argument that is often made that all these clubs, these are actually entry barriers. And you may think environmental issues are very important. We don't think they're that important. 
and why are you imposing your standards on us? So I, I heard this argument because multinationals have, essentially they have an internal regulatory structure. Nike employs, I think, more than 2,000 regulators that are going around checking labor laws in various companies. And now with the apparel industry, part of the Rana Plaza tragedy in Bangladesh, the same thing is happening in the apparel industry. They have an army of regulators going to every suppliers. And some of the comments I've heard when I visited India is, look, this is India. Here, minimum wage is very different. Here, people have different expectations. Don't impose your American standards on us. And if you don't want to do business with us, tell us that. But don't go this roundabout way of imposing these standards. I think the same issue was raised by somebody on farmers. That farmers sometimes find the fair trade requirements to be very onerous. And it's very unfair. And it's kind of a non-tariff barrier to international trade. So that argument has been made. And I think, I think it's worth investigating. One simply cannot dismiss, dismiss it off and say X, Y, or Z. So building on this, is our, I was wondering about the global South, like thinking about these contexts with weak states, weak public law, high levels of poverty, so there might not be sort of domestic support for environmental protection. Are you seeing voluntary programs, like you're talking about the voluntary programs that may be exported by US, European firms or organizations, are there any homegrown voluntary programs happening in developing countries? Like are the conditions just not right? I think it depends. Sorry. Responsible mining <laughs> is domestically. What is that? In what? I think what is happening is because trade is so focused on international supply chains, domestic NGOs are looking for the leverage point. If you want to put pressure on domestic firms, you have to go around to the international buyer and say, it's your job to put pressure here because we can't put pressure here. It's kind of a boomerang effect. That yeah, yeah. So I think people are worried. People are concerned. Like if FSC was essentially led by local NGOs, it's a forest or be cut left, right and center. But we don't have leverage to put pressure on our own firms. So can we motivate international supply chains to put the pressure? So I think there is politics because everybody, essentially people want good, you know, proper life. They want clean air, clean water. They don't want exploitation. But the domestic political opportunity structure may not be amenable to that kind of advocacy lobby. But the international space, that's a globalization can be good at times <laughs> because it creates a new political opportunity structure for you know, promotion of what we call liberal values. Are we out of time? We are at 3.30, okay. uh, that's there. but we have snacks and we wanna continue the conversation over the reception, but before that, maybe we can all um, offer an applause and a thank you for a wonderful <laughs> The palisters in the other room, so maybe if people want to snack, bring it back, continue the conversation here. Um, we'll do that. Was yesterday? Was it? Last job. Oh.